Tim is going to be continuing our sermon series through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and we've come to one of the um, uh, famous slash infamous passages in the book of Mark, and that is Jesus' discourse on what some people would see as the end of the world or the end times, or the fall of Jerusalem, or all of the above. So Mark chapter 13. So Tim's going to be taking us through that a little bit later on this morning. So in relation to that, we've got a reading from 2 Thessalonians, a kind of like a complimentary uh, passage. So the reading, again, which relates to Mark 13, is from 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 8. And this is how it goes, if you'd like to follow along. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by our prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendour of his coming. Okay, so Mark chapter 13. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time. For it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I've told you everything ahead of time. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. 
As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Good morning. Have you ever read a verse from the Bible um, and sat back and contemplated it and thought, well, what am I supposed to do with that? Uh, yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> and maybe a very small percentage of you um, go, gee, I'm glad I'm not doing a sermon on that. Uh, well, I certainly said one of those sentences this week. Uh, we're looking at Mark chapter 13 as, as we've gone through, and it's going to take us about 20 minutes to have a look at it today. And it's a different type of chapter to the narrative that we've been working through uh, in recent weeks. There's a, a few names that this chapter is given. And we're going to go through some of those because they're a great way of understanding more of what this chapter is about and why some parts of it are written uh, in this way. So um, uh, if you could just go forward. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you very much. Um, notice how so much of this chapter is words by uh, Jesus. So what we've got is a discourse. And it's a discourse about the end times, although there's a little bit of nuance to that, which we're going to get into a bit later. Now, we have the Greek word eschatos, meaning last or final. So the chapter is sometimes known as the eschatological discourse. Now, Jesus speaks from the Mount of Olives, and there's symbolic significance to this as well. It's literally described as being opposite the temple. And Jesus is delivering this final judgment whilst uh, opposite it. And there's also an Old Testament throwback in here too. And there's heaps of throwbacks like these within uh, this whole chapter if you go looking for them. In Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4, we read this talking about the Lord. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. And the rest of the verses around it are talking about the Mount of Olives being where God declares the capture, sack, and devastation of Jerusalem. So Mark 13 fulfills what was foretold in Zechariah. So the fact that Jesus is on the Mount of Olives during this discourse is quite important and quite symbolic. And for these reasons, Mark 13 is sometimes referred to as the Olivet Discourse. And the other term that could be used to describe this chapter is that it is an apocalyptic. Now, um, Hollywood's use of the term, uh, term apocalypse has uh, been in all sorts of contexts uh, over the years. Uh, what it actually means is describing or prophesying the complete destruction of the world. There's all sorts of parts of the Bible that are apocalyptic, uh, like parts of Daniel uh, and the book of Revelation, of course. But there's some differences with the way that, um, we, that it looks here in, in Mark. For example, apocalyptic texts are often written in the first person. Look at this uh, excerpt from Daniel chapter 7 in the Old Testament. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And in the same chapter, Daniel famously talks about his vision of four great beasts. Uh, these are written in the first person singular, and uh, such writing often includes visions and bizarre imagery, whereas Mark chapter 13 is 
woven on the warp of second-person plural imperatives. Uh, obviously, that's uh, something I just knew off the top of my head and is uh, definitely not just a copy and paste from reference material. Um, but seriously, there's a lot of uh, immediacy and practical values in chapter 13 than in most apocalyptic literature, which means this chapter sometimes gets called the little apocalypse, uh, which reminds me of the idea of being a little bit pregnant. Uh, it's just a little apocalypse. <laughs> Um, okay, so I hope that gives you uh, a better flavour of the text that we're working um, through today. Let's spend just 30 seconds reminding ourselves of the lead up to this chapter before we dig deeper into, into some of these verses. So in the past two or three chapters, Jesus has predicted his death at the hands of Jewish and Gentile leaders three times. He has countered the authority of the Sanhedrin in the temple by challenging the Pharisees, the Sadducees and the scribes. Jesus enters the temple and says, you guys aren't here to bring glory to God. You're just here to make money. You've turned the temple into a den of robbers. And he upends their tables, sending animals and coins everywhere. And now Jesus has got news for Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Guys, this, this temple is coming down. And it's coming down soon. Not one stone here will be left on another. I say, but Jesus, when? How are we going to know? What are the signs going to be? And Jesus says, there's going to be wars, natural disasters, false prophets, and persecution. But guess what? These things are a fact of life, part of human existence. None of these things will mean that the end has come. And all four of those things, war, natural disasters, false prophets, and persecution, all happened in the decades afterwards in ways that were really significant for the Jewish people. The most significant was the war with Rome, which resulted in the Jewish rebellion in 66 AD, and then Jerusalem fell in 70 AD. It was brutal. Listen to this account from uh, Josephus on that. So Caesar ordered the whole city and the temple to be razed to the ground. All the rest of the wall encompassing the city was so completely leveled to the ground as to leave future visitors to the spot no ground for believing that it had ever been inhabited. Brutal. And this is the way that Jesus in Mark prophesizes it. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Ah, uh, yes, the abomination that causes desolation. It sounds like a, uh, sounds like a Halloween movie, actually. Um, but there's a, a wide range of things that can be considered uh, abominations, right? Let's put some flesh on those abominable bones. Um, so idolatry is often cited in the Bible as an abomination, where worship of, of false gods or idols replaces the worship of the true God. In this chapter, Jesus warns about false messiahs and prophets. We can see idolatry in practice today as well, of course, with people placing undue importance on material possessions, wealth, or celebrity. We also have corruption, practices such as deceit, exploitation, and injustice, false teachings, and false prophets leading people away from the truth, injustice, so unjust laws uh, or judgments that pervert justice, and finally, Desecration of sacred places as an abomination. So the abomination of desolation mentioned here in Mark 13 refers to a violation of the holy place. There may also be reference to the man of lawlessness that uh, we heard in 2 Thessalonians, as both describe a blasphemous act that desecrates a holy space. Interestingly, Mark is pretty blatant about making sure we have an idea of what he's talking about. We have this weird, in bold there, let the reader understand, which is one of the biggest like nudge, nudge, wink, winks in the, uh, in the whole Bible. You might recall that Mark may well have been in Rome when writing the gospel, and he was writing for a Gentile audience. So he may have been using this term, which had already been previously used in the Old Testament to describe a previous temple destruction, so that he didn't have to directly write when the Romans destroyed the temple. Now, to many Jewish people at the time, they'd be thinking, 
The fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple must mean that the end times are upon us. This is how important Jerusalem and the temple were to their faith. If those were gone, then that must have been a sign of the end times. But Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says that the one who stands firm through all the tribulations to the end will be saved. And here's the thing about what Jesus is saying in this chapter. Jesus is talking about things in the near future and he's talking about things in the far future. The destruction of the temple is a paradigm of something that's even greater that's going to be happening. So these verses, it's really important to to understand this, these verses are weaving in a prophecy of the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, which is not the end times, even though some thought it might be, with the second coming of Christ, which is in the end times. And the end times are described as a time when God will create a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation free from sin, suffering and death, where God's people will dwell with him. Second Peter 3.13 says it like this, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And this is the symbolic language that we get in Mark uh, 13. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Uh, At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now, this is more like the language you would expect from an apocalyptic sort of chapter. But these verses are actually quoted uh, from Isaiah. And these astronomical prophecies, they're not to be taken literally. So you're not supposed to sit there and say, hmm, the, the star's falling from the sky. I wonder how the physics of that would work. No, what's trying to be conveyed here is that this is an event of cosmic significance. Christ coming in power and glory is of cosmic significance. The Old Testament has often symbolized the presence and glory of God with clouds. And crucially, we can infer from that symbolism an important message to the Jewish people. Where Jesus returns in clouds, it means that God's presence is not in the temple, but in him, the Son of Man. And what does he come to do? Again, in this symbolic language, he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds. Jesus will regather the scattered people and they will be one under him. Finally today, let's take a look again at the final 10 uh, verses that deal with the uncertainty of the time of the end. Biblical scholars believe these verses to be a bit of a a hodgepodge. They're a sort of a collective of various sayings and parables that have all been put together. And as part of these, we read Jesus saying this in verse 31, which is uh, bolded up there. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. What a remarkable claim of authority from Jesus. Remember, he's atop the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. The temple walls are hundreds of meters long, a grand mega structure. And Jesus says that temple will perish. The world will perish, but my word will never perish. Like the disciples, the church throughout the ages has sought for infallible proofs of the end. I think this is an inevitable form or inevitable part of human nature because if you can convince yourself of certainty, then you can relieve yourself of the responsibility of waiting and watching. But these verses tell us don't try and construct a timetable, don't try to be an eschatological code cracker. That is foolish. Look at uh, verse 32, also bolded there. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not the, even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. We can't understand when the end times will come, but Jesus says, if you want to understand who I am, then you need to look beyond my life and beyond my death even to my return. And the listeners and readers are told, Don't be deceived by unsettling events or persons in the meantime. Not even the destruction of the temple. Set your eyes upon Jesus in a way that is unfaltering. 
Now, I debated putting this in, but uh, I, think it's, I think it's helpful. So imagine a terrible outcome where in the middle of the night, this church building burns down. Think about what that does to a church community. People would understandably question, why would God have our church burn down? How is that just? It could be faith-shaking. It could be absolutely faith-shaking for that to happen. But in this apocalyptic chapter, Jesus teaches that a structure will not be where God resides until the end times. The temple was no longer the focus of Christian hope. Christ transcends the temple just as he transcends death. Salvation is not a place. It is not a building. The salvation of Jesus is a gift from God. It is grace. It brings about reconciliation between humanity and God without a temple. And it offers us hope, the promise of Jesus' return and the establishment of God's kingdom, even though no one knows about that day or hour. Walking with Christ is not a way of dispensing with mystery, but of living in mystery and the faith in God that this requires. And the life of faith is not an exemption from adversity. Some of us know that all too well. The life of faith is not an exemption from adversity, but a reliance on the promise of God to bear witness to the gospel through adversity and to be saved for eternal life through it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we, um, in these verses, uh, we read about um, terrible tribulations and struggles and things that are prophesied, uh, things that have now happened and things still to come as well. Lord, it's a, a complex chapter and I pray that we um, can just have an ability to understand that uh, deeper and a little bit more as we uh, go into our week. Lord, please uh, help us to always be mindful of that day that is in the future and to be watchful and mindful of it and uh, and to know that um, ultimately things are going to be renewed and that your glory um, will be full in the, in the fullness of time. But in the meantime, Lord, please help us to bring um, a little bit of heaven to this earth um, for us to try and bring this kingdom into this present age and please help us in the ways that we can do that in our own lives. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>